Bless the Lord. We need to command our hearts to do that, even in the midst of crazy times. Even when things uh, anger us, or when we look around and we're saddened by what we see, or we're going through circumstances that are not where we want them to be, we command our souls to obey the Lord and bless Him. And so, as somebody said to me this morning, uh, today, as much or more than any day, we need to be here. We need to be here gathered. We need to be here joining us online where our souls are knit together to bless the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't you make people feel welcome? Uh, tell them God bless you and greet them this morning with the wave. Good morning. Do your best Rose Parade impression there. You may be seated. There's an art to waving for three hours straight if you have to, if you're ever on a parade or anything like that. Uh, so, glad again that uh, we could all be here today. And there, there's certainly a series of emotions that many of us are feeling over just what we've been watching for the past week. And certainly the events on Wednesday uh, were deplorable to us. And so, we, we need to be able to be here and be grounded and rooted what is eternal and what matters. Uh, so I'm thankful to be able to do this. And, and then to let what we do as a church when we gather speak into how we talk and think and act in every area, including politics, which is certainly at the forefront right now of the news cycle, rightly so. So this is more than just a hobby. This is our life source for connecting with our Savior and God. I don't have any announcements, which always pleases me, uh, so we get to continue in worship through prayer, and I'm going to invite Pastor Ken to come up and pray, and uh, I do know we need to continue to pray for Dave Johnson, uh, for Lynn Beard, as well as uh, Tracy Bradshaw, who uh, took sick last night and had to go to the ER, so we want to pray for him. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for making our hearts happy, filled with your joy, even in, the, even in the midst of difficult situations or the world that we live in or whatever our personal circumstances are, Lord. The joy of the Lord is certainly our strength. We thank you for your word that brings power to our lives, brings direction to our lives through your Holy Spirit. Lord, we, we pray for those. Uh, we pray for Dave Johnson. Uh, as he's in rehab, but very, very slowly uh, moving forward in that process uh, from the stroke. And we ask for your just continued blessing upon him, your blessing upon Linda to give her direction and encouragement and hope through this time too, which can be very difficult for a spouse. Pray for Lynn Beard as she continues to, to heal and <clears throat> some stumbling blocks within that. But uh, you know all things, Lord. You know exactly what needs to be done. And we ask for your blessing upon her as well as the wisdom and the care of the doctors to, to uh, help that along. And we do pray for Tracy Bradshaw. She became ill last night and was sick and uh, that <clears throat> this day may be a new day for her and that she can praise the Lord and the healing power of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Lord, we, we give you thanks for all things. We give you thanks for our church, this uh, body of Christ, for those that are with, with us live, for those who are online. Uh, may the power of your Holy Spirit just move and, and touch each one, Lord, as your word goes forth through the preaching of the word this morning through Pastor Stephen and our praise and worship team as well. So thank you, Lord, for allowing us to pray that you intercede for us, you hear our prayers, and uh, you answer our prayers. You are a good God. Let us pray the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us all stand again to worship. Amen.
Father, we thank You for the Word. The daily bread that feeds our souls. The truth spoken from You in love. So Lord, as we have that Word read to us, would You attune our hearts to Your voice? And open our minds for understanding and our spirits to receive this good word. We truly are lost without you, but in you we have life. We thank you for that life. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite up our scripture reader, Louise Moyer, going to read from Matthew 25. You can turn there and follow along. Good morning. morning. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. This is the word of the Lord, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 40. Next Sunday is what has been known as, marked as, celebrated as, remembered as Sanctity of Life Sunday. Around the country, churches will be affirming their commitment to life, especially life of unborn children. And I just thought we'd get a jump start on it and have it this week. Next week also is Martin Luther King Jr., Monday, technically, but it's the weekend, and so I want to address that next weekend as well, and I couldn't do two sermons in one Sunday, so I've decided today to speak about and to focus on the sanctity of life. Now, pro-life is not new for us as a church. Those of you who are familiar with our, our bylaws, or more technically our covenant, our church covenant, know that within our own church covenant, we say that we as an organization, as a church as a whole, are pro-life, we support life, and we won't support causes that further abortion. So we've, as a church, this is not new to us. And for many of you as individuals, in conversations I've had with you over the years, you've relayed to me that this is a cause that's close to your heart, to be pro-life. So I, too, have spoken on this at least once a year, every year since I have been here, um, sometimes more than that or if it's not a whole sermon, to to integrate it and speak to it as part of the message that I have. So pro-life is not new to us, and the question I 
run across for myself each year, so what is there new to say? Right, what can I say that's different or new that hasn't already been said? And then I had a sense of peace that said, it's not always about saying something new. It's about saying what needs to be said, even if it's familiar. And affirming the things that we know to be true. Because the reality is, that's what we do every week. If I'm coming to you week in and week out with some new, something that's new, beyond maybe new to you, if it's truly new, then that's a problem. Because this is the old, old story. And we're retelling this. And as we speak here this morning, I'm not going to necessarily be introducing some radically new thought about what it means to be pro-life. I want to reaffirm what we know to be true from the Scriptures. But I will say this. There is, at least for me, something kind of new in it, and perhaps it will be somewhat new for you. Uh, so I want to tell you in advance what my goals are for this sermon and then give you a little insight into the part I believe is maybe new or a slightly new perspective for me and hopefully for you as well. So here's what I'm going to try to do. First of all, in my sermon, the three things I'm hoping to do this morning. I want to reaffirm why we as a church are pro-life. And I'm going to give you the answer right now in advance, because God is for life. Secondly, and this is the part that's newish to me and challenging my own thinking, is I want to expand our vision of pro-life. I want us to see that the concept of being pro-life is much more than, not less than, but much more than the question of opposing abortion. This is, if there were any note I'd like to be dominant this morning, it's this one. Not that I will be spending the most amount of time on it, but it's in a sense where I am leading us to, as we look at the Scriptures together, is this idea of seeing a bigger picture of what it means to say that we are for life. And then the last thing I would like to do is give a couple of practical ways to live it out. I think that's a necessary thing. If you preach week in, week out, and you only stay up here in the head and the theory, and you don't help give some practical ways to make it flesh and blood, then it's not going to be that helpful. So hopefully we'll have a couple of ways that we can live out this concept, this idea, and this expanded vision of seeing what it means to say that we are pro-life. So let's do that with God's help. I don't dare try and come into this pulpit on my own, so I want to pray and ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your spirit that we have sung about that is present here with us, imperfect as we are, prone to mistakes, or as the song says, prone to wander, the errors in the things that we think and do and the ways that we act, and yet you condescend in the most compassionate way to make your presence here with us. So Lord, I don't pretend that that means everything that we do or say is, is right or perfect, but what we do is we come into the very presence of the one who is perfect. And we seek to be molded. So Lord, mold us this morning. Conform us to your will. May your word speak. May it be that daily bread that feeds our souls. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I want to make a statement and I don't think it's a radical statement, but I think it is prone to possibly being misheard. And so I want to make the statement, and then I want to tell you what I'm not saying and what I am trying to say in it. The statement is this, simply, God is pro-life. But before you mishear me to equating God with a single political position, which is what comes to most of our minds when we hear pro-life, before you hear me toward conflating the two, I want to explain what I mean by saying God is pro-life. And so to help make that distinction between the narrowly political, which is important and I will talk about, but is only one component, I'm going to change up the wording this morning. It means exactly the same thing, but I'm going to say it in different words to help us, to help me, to see a bigger picture. So I would actually rather say it this way. God is for life. 
mean, that's what pro means, if you know the, the prefix there. But to say that God is for life. And the challenge then for us is to likewise be for life. But what does it mean to say that God is for life? Well, there's at least three things that I'm meaning to say when I make the declaration that God is for life. There could be more that could be said, and that's true every week. Every sermon it can only speak to so much. I had a friend this week share with me, ask for prayer, that he's going to be presenting a paper to some fellow pastors and, and uh, ministry leaders, and he said, I'm seeking to do the impossible in one paper. And I said, I can relate because <laughs> that's what I try to do every week, <laughs> the impossible. Try to get everything in there. It can't all be said. But there are at least three important things that need to be said when I say God is for life. What do I mean? Well, first of all, God is the source of life. I mean, this is a basic Christian affirmation that is spelled out so clearly in the Bible that it's our starting point. To say God is for life is to recognize first and foremost that He is the source of life. That He is the one from whom all life comes. And we see it in the Bible from the very beginning, right? God is the one who's created all things. And even more beyond just all things being created, we're told in the Scriptures that God specifically breathed life into human beings. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. God is the one who imparts life to us. Were he not to have done that, there would be no life on this planet. There would be no spontaneous way that non-life becomes life. God has done that. And then as we've seen, God has specifically done that for human beings. And the Scriptures affirm this about, of course, God the Father, the Creator, but the New Testament teaches us this is absolutely true then of Jesus Christ as well. That He is the source and giver of life. Being one with the Father, what is true of him is true of Jesus. He is the source of life. And so John the Apostle, when he writes a letter to the churches that he was overseeing, he begins this letter by calling Jesus the Word of Life. John chapter, or 1 John chapter 1, which my small group was going through, and I came across this verse and said, oh, remember that one for the message. <laughs> this will be helpful. 1 John chapter 1 says, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched. And he's talking here about Jesus. His first-hand account of knowing and meeting Jesus. He says, this one that we've touched and felt and, and seen and looked upon and heard, he says these things concerning the word of life. Now this is going to be more than just a message of life. It's not simply the, the things we know that God says about life, but rather he is referring to life, the very source of life itself. Jesus becomes evident if we just keep reading because he describes the life as having been manifested. The life was made manifest. And if it's still not clear to you, we, knowing, looking back at the Gospel of John, we know that the Word became flesh. This is John, the same writer, saying it in a fresh way here and saying that the Word of life was manifested among us. And so he says, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Jesus is the word of life. And I can't think of any other way to understand that concept of calling a person the word of life than to recognize that he is the one who speaks and life happens. That life comes from him. He is the giver of life. And so it's not simply that he has a bag full of life and happens to be dispensing it, but he is giving his very essence. He's breathing it into his creation. He is the word of life. He breathed life into man and he became a living being. So God is for life because he is the source of life. In fact, Jesus is called the author of life. And I love that picture. The one who is the one who writes this story. In Acts chapter 3, he's called the, Jesus called the author of life, but ironically, it's in contrast to the fact that he was put to death. 
So Peter, as he's preaching this sermon and he's speaking to his fellow Jews and he's saying, listen, we've blown it big time because we chose to release a murderer and put to death the author of life. He says, the God of Abraham, this is Acts 3.15, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Barabbas, who was imprisoned for at least, if not more, at least for taking the life of another person, a taker of life, says that's who you wanted, and you chose to put to death the giver of life, the author of life. And so he says, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And I think he throws that in, in, just rhetorically speaking, because this is where his sermon is leading, to say Jesus isn't dead anymore. But especially in this context of thinking of Jesus as the author of life, to think that he was put to death, does that mean that, he, that life has been defeated? No. He was. He, he fully died. His life was extinguished from that body. But death couldn't have victory over the source of life. And so he was raised from the dead. God is for life because all life comes from Him. And when we think about the very nature of God, there is a self-sustaining life and a self-giving life that's essential to the nature of who God is. Now, another thing it means. So, if first of all, it means to say God is for life means to say He's a source of life. It also means to say that God gave each of us who have life infinite value. God has given us infinite value. He has made humankind, and humankind only, in His image. So we are bearers of the image of God, and as such, we who are alive have infinite value. And I call it infinite value because there's nothing finite or created that can be compared to it. The life that has been given to us as the image of God, is of infinite value and worth. And the telling of the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 is really leading to this big idea, to this apex or zenith in the story of creation. He goes through the days and he lists all of the physical things and then he moves on to the animals and plants, but then the culmination, the high point of his creation, is when he makes man and woman in his image. And so he gives them dignity and worth and a value that can't be measured. So Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says that God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. He's getting it all in there. He's saying "You're, you're superior to all of these things and you have a responsibility over all of these things. Because I have made you my image bearers over all of these things. And so then it goes on to say, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Men and women have inestimable value because we are the image bearers. We are made in the image of God. So for God to say he is for life, is to say that He has invested us with a value that can't be measured in giving us life, in making us in His own image. And the psalmist is contemplating these things. Because when you look around, it's sometimes easy to to begin to, to diminish the value of life, especially even your own at times. When you contemplate how big the world is, or go out beyond the world, how big the universe is, I mean, we don't even have a really good idea of how big the universe is. And we know, in a sense, I say no in quotes, we have a better sense of the size of the universe than than David could have had when he wrote Psalm 8. But still, he had a big universe when he looked up and he saw stars and moon. And he said, I'm so small. We're all just so small. And I think this is a temptation for us to begin to minimize, oh, we're just little specks in the universe. God says, no way. And the psalmist says, no way, because we have been made in God's image. So Psalm chapter 80 says, the psalmist says, when I look at your heavens, 
the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him? So he could have easily fallen into despair, become some existentialist philosopher, and just said, ah, it's meaningless. But he doesn't do that. Instead it says, yet. (laughs) I see with my eyes and I feel insignificant. But then I think about what you have said and what you have done for me and for us. It says, yet you have made him, that is humankind, a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And then in an echo of Genesis chapter 1, he reminds himself and us of the place we have in God's creation as its pinnacle, as its peak, because we are the image bearers of God. And so he says, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. And he lists off sheep and ox and beasts and birds and fish and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. So the psalmist is celebrating the worth and dignity that God has bestowed on man by making him in his image. God is for life because he's the source of life. He is for life because he has invested human life with an infinite value. And then to say God is for life is to recognize that God protects human life. God values and humans uh, values human life. And so he has put safeguards around saying, you don't have any right to take it unjustly. And when he was giving his law to his people Israel, there on Mount Sinai, he gave them the Ten Commandments. Number six, you shall not murder. You shall not murder. You shall not take life unjustly. Even before He gave it in the Ten Commandments. When he was speaking to Noah, he gave a warning. And he said, anyone who takes life will be liable for their own life. So Genesis chapter 6, I mean, sorry, chapter 9, verses 5 and 6 say this, And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. What he means is, should your life be taken from you, I will require a reckoning from the one who takes it. And interestingly, he says, whether it's man or beast. So, The bear that tears apart the human may not be culpable in the same way that a human being is culpable for doing the same thing, but there's a recognition that what has happened has violated life, the principle of life and the value of human beings in particular because they're made in his image. And so to read the whole verse, it says, "And For your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. For every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For God made man in his own image. He has given it an esteemable, inestimable value. And so he has put safeguards, he has protected it. Exodus 23, verse 7 says, Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. And then... A passage that, it's interesting, Exodus 21, verses 22 and 23. I'm thankful that these verses are in here because much of our battle for life right now, one of the main fronts in our culture is the realization that there is life in the womb that we are legally allowing to be destroyed. And there's a verse here that isn't, it wasn't written for abortion. But as we look at it, we learn that God values the life even while it's still in the womb. Now we could find that in lots of places because God talks about knitting us together in our mother's womb. He, He cares. He's already at work forming and crafting that image of himself in human beings in the womb. But interestingly, it's just this passage about making sure that there's justice here. And so he says, when men strive together, this is Exodus 21, 22, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman, so that her child, her, uh, so that her children come out, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fine, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. So, you can picture the scene: two men going at it. Perhaps the the wife comes in, you know, honey, don't, and somebody comes and hits her away, and hits her, and the child is delivered, alive. Well, then. That person's life is spared, but there's still a fine. But if that child dies, then it is the life of the one who took that life. And so he says, 
But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. He values life. He's given it worth and value even in the womb. All the way to, as we might say, to the tomb. And so here we see that God is undeniably for life. The source of life. The one who has given it its value in human beings by making us in his image and then safeguarding it by outlawing, by making it clear that to take life unjustly deserves life. And so, if God is for life, I think this answers the question of why we should be for life. We should seek to emulate our Father. Now, we can't do it, obviously, in the sense that we are the source of life. Even when you think about a a, a mother and a father coming together and and there's a new baby there, they're not imparting life where there was no life. That is beyond us. Only God is the true source of life. So it can't mean that we're the source of life. It also doesn't mean that we're the ones that give value to life. That comes from God himself. Which, by the way, I think, does have a bearing on political philosophy because no government gives you your rights. A government has a job to safeguard rights that somebody else has given, the Father, including life. But that's a rabbit trail, not really going down. (laughs) But here, I think it, it is worth noting that we're not to follow God's lead by being for life because we're the source of life, nor because we're the ones that place the judgment or value of life But because he thinks this way, we should think this way. So as I think, as I move beyond the why, we're we're for life because God is for life. And I ask the question, then what does it look like for us to be for life? What does it mean for us to be for life? Well, I think it means that we have a certain attitude toward and a certain value for all human life. To put it plainly, to be for life is to value all human life according to the value God gives it, and then to act accordingly. And that part is very important. Because unfortunately in church, too often we've gotten really good at having the right thoughts and not letting them percolate out into the right actions. But if we're going to say that we are for life, we need to have the right mindset, and then we need to act on that mindset. So, That's when I think of being for life. Let me be clear, it's never less than an affirmation of the value of life in the womb. When I'll say the traditional way of thinking of when we say pro-life, we're talking and usually thinking in terms of the value of life in the womb. I'm not saying any less than that, but I'm saying it's more than that. It's a way of seeing all people that transcends worldly values that we attach to people. Things like intelligence. Right? We tend to value somebody if they're if they have a certain level of intelligence. I worry for the day in which you can tell from a genetic tag how smart or unsmart a little baby's gonna be inside the womb. I don't know if that'll ever happen. But if it does, it doesn't change the value of that baby in the womb or that adult who has a low IQ in the least. And I think this can speak to the way we treat people who, I honestly don't know what the right way to say it is, and I'm not trying to be, disabled people. Do we value them because they have a certain level of intelligence? Or what about wealth? I mean, if they're successful and they have the the promise before them of a a life that's going to be prosperous, then they have value. Or what about, as we've been talking about, ethnicity? Well, if they're going to be a certain kind or a certain color, then they have value. Obviously, you see, we have to transcend these things. And then it starts getting harder because then it's like, what about personality? I have to value that person who I really can't stand, the way they act and think. My enemy. Goodness. Morality aren't the measure of the value of a human being either. Thank God, because every one of us would be up a creek. So we don't measure somebody because they're a good person. 
We don't measure them and give them value, I should say, from God's perspective. So, belief, size, strength, health, no other criteria other than made in God's image. It is to see the inestimable image of God. To be for life is to see this image of God even in those whom Jesus refers to as the least of these. So practically speaking for Jesus, what it meant to be for life was to dine with sinners and tax collectors. It was to show grace to an adulterer. It was to be broken hearted over rebellious people. It was to have compassion on the marginalized and the forgotten. This is the image of pro-life that we are given from Jesus himself. How do we think about and treat the least of these? And so for us to say that we are for life is to say we, have that, we, we give that same value that God does. We assign the same value that he does, and then we act accordingly. So one of the things, and this is where I, in a sense, I want to say it was a new thought to me. Perhaps that's overstating, and I'm sure I've thought of it before. It, it, it hit me more like a new wave to me, is to say I'd like to see the same passion, the same clarity of, of the worth that we who identify as pro-life have for children in the womb, I'd like to see that same worth, that same passion radiate outward to encompass all aspects of human life. Doing so will not diminish in any way the value of those precious children in the womb. But it's going to connect it more holistically to the value that will encompass them their whole life, well beyond the womb. So it's tying it to the, the value in the womb is the same value that extends beyond. And of course, people make mistakes on both sides of this. So there are many, unfortunately, some of our laws reflect it, that there is a value once they come out of the womb. And we would say, that's a mistake. But let us not make the opposite mistake and say, well, we really love them and value them when they're in the womb. And then when they come out and they start making all these bonehead mistakes and not lining up and not believing the right things, their life and value diminishes. I'd love to see the value of life radiate outward to encompass all people. So that we're treating them with grace. And as we've talked about in weeks past, we have empathy. And we act toward people with mercy and respect. Because you don't have to agree with somebody to value them. Let me say that again because it's so important. You don't have to agree with somebody to value them. You don't have to approve of the choices they make to value them as a choice maker. And I think every parent knows this instinctively. Because we don't agree with everything our kids do. <laughs> Some of you more than others. <laughs> Even my children whom I love deeply, and they're, they're young, and, and, but there's of course things I don't agree with that they think or say or do. But my value, the way I value them doesn't diminish because of that. And the same is true for all life. And the beautiful thing about this is this is how Jesus sees us. He doesn't write us off because we didn't line up perfectly with what he called us to. But he shows us mercy and grace because he's for life. And perhaps the greatest and most challenging statement Jesus made in this regard was when he told us to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Let me just say, when I saw the outlaw hooligans breaking into the Capitol building, I was mad, as I assume probably most of you or all of you were. It made me mad. And when I get mad, I, I, I don't always think straight. And I start... Oh, dude, there's people. Like, just to myself, to be honest, I mean, maybe a little bit with Sarah because I talk and she's patient and listens to me. Uh, but I did have to slow down. And, and I didn't excuse the behavior in the least. But I had to remember, even people who are doing things I think are reprehensible, they have value. They're human beings. And I need to remember that value and have a compassion and an empathy. And it doesn't change the law, I think that they should be prosecuted 
I think first service accidentally said persecuted. Prosecuted. I mean, they should be prosecuted for the crimes that they've committed. But you're not diminishing justice by caring for the one who needs to have justice done. In fact, what you're doing is having a more holistic God view of what justice is. And so when I think of for life, what it means for us is to have that mindset towards all people, including in the womb, but not stopping there, but radiating outward to all human life. So that's what I think it means. The why, why are we for life? Because God is for life. What does it mean? It means we adopt that same mindset and then we act on it. So what does it look like then in practice? Well, that's a bigger question than I can answer, so I'm going to modestly give you a couple of suggestions, a couple ideas of practical ways that we can be for life. And I think the first thing, and maybe it covers in a sense all of the ones I'm going to give more specifically, drill down into, but it means, being for life means speaking up, having a voice, speaking up for the value of those who may not have a voice for themselves. Or if they have a voice, it's just not heard the same way that perhaps your voice can be heard. And so speaking up for their dignity, for justice, and very often for their very lives. We need to open our mouths. That's what the advice to King Lemuel in Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9 was. As king, his mother said, listen, you need to open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. To be for life is to speak up. It's to speak up for the life of those who can't speak for themselves. Now, undoubtedly, that must include children in the womb. There's no better picture of somebody who has no voice than a child in the womb. And so we have to speak up. We unequivocally must affirm the value of life in the womb, that it shares the same infinite value as the rest of humanity, and so it must be protected from unjust death. And we must speak loudly about that, namely speaking about unjust death through abortion. Now, there are certain, there's certainly a political component to this. I've been going to length here this morning to try and see it bigger than, but we also have to recognize that in the culture we live in, there is a political component to this, but there's also a danger. And the danger is I don't want to collapse what it means to be pro-life into exclusively a political position, and I certainly don't want to make the mistake even going beyond that to a certain political party. To say that we are for life is not simply to say, oh, I identify with this party and not that party. That's not God's vision of what it means to be for life. But because we do live and we have political organizations, we need to bring for life or pro-life into all of those spheres. So if you're a Republican, you should speak up for life, but continue to speak up to make sure your party stays pro-life in its platform. Because you know what? There's no golden rule that says a political party's platform will never change. They have changed tremendously over time. Both parties so to be for life, if you're identifying in the sphere of the Republican Party, is to say, keep that as a value. And then I would challenge and say, and then let's have even a broader view of what it means to be for life. An expansive view of life that values the life of marginalized people in every sphere of life. Prisoners, immigrants, disabled, elderly. To speak for life, not just in one narrow platform, piece of the platform, but in the whole thing. And if you're a Democrat, then speak up for life within your party because the same truth is there. Just because right now it feels like it's an, a, a part of the platform that's never going to change, don't buy into that lie. If that's the party that you identify, speak for life in that context. And then many of you say, I'm neither. I don't want to be identified with either one of those parties. And I, I, can, I can sympathize with that sense, especially on an election year when we all get so frustrated by both sides and everything that's going on. But listen, you, you're not off the hook because even if you don't identify with either political party, you have elected officials who are accountable to you, so use your voice to influence them. 
And I'm not saying call them up and say you have to vote this party platform or that party platform. I'm saying speak for life. Use your email. Call them. Let them know when legislation shows up that you want them, regardless of party, to vote for life. And regardless of issue. Because obviously, you know, I had in my mind the issue of abortion, but there are plenty of other issues where we should speak up and speak for life. Now, looking beyond politics, being for life, I think also, here's a practical way to do it, it means being radically pro-mom as well as pro-baby. It means to be radically pro-mom. And I think, I praise God, I really believe this is an area that has seen tremendous growth and change in the pro-life movement in the last decade or so, where this this actively pursuing the care for, love for, and compassion towards the mom or the dad or the people whose lives are now found to be in a difficult, distressful, hard place because they find themselves with a, an unplanned or unwanted pregnancy. To be for life is not to look past the mom and say, only the baby, but I'm for mom and baby. To be for life, then, is to have compassion and see the value of that mom who's in that difficult position. And then to care for somebody in distress in a selfless and gracious manner is to emulate Jesus. I'm so thankful for groups like Clearway Clinic who are just doing so well in this area, who when a woman walks through those doors, she has the inestimable value of being made in God's image, and she is loved. I think that's part of what it means to say we're for life. At every stage, at every part of life, to care for people. And then I'm also thankful that there's been a growing compassion towards those who have experienced abortion. The, talking within the, the pro-life movement, if you will, a continuing, growing understanding. Do we have ways to go? Of course. But there is a growing compassion, a care for a person who's made a life choice that maybe we don't support the life choice, but we emulate Christ's care for everybody because that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. Can I tell you, you have made choices that he doesn't like and agree with, and it has not stopped him from caring for you or for me. So we need to have compassion. We need to be caring. And one of the ways I think that just one of the most down-to-earth practical ways that this compassion for men and women who have been impacted by abortion should make itself manifest is in how we speak about abortion. Especially when we're in a place that maybe we think, oh well, you know, we're among friends so we can sort of just speak in this uh, unguarded way. We're in church or we're in, we're in small group. We need, to, we need to guard our words to speak words that show compassion. And it's not to suddenly now I'm not going to say anything that's, that's pro-life because I'm not saying that we stop saying valuable things. I'm saying we think about how we say them and we say it compassionately. And one of the things I thought that could help us do this is just have this image in your mind. As you are about to say something about abortion, Imagine that your daughter or your mother or your sister has had an abortion and is standing right there next to you when you say it. Now, how are you going to speak? I hope it will change the language you use, the heart that comes out. Because really, the language needs to be a reflection of the heart. And so if you do that, and, and to be honest, I bet it's not hard for us to do that the Guttmacher Institute says that one in four women will have had an abortion by the age of 45. So it's very likely that your mother or your sister or your daughter has gone through this pain. And they don't need your harsh words. They need your compassion. They need your valuing them no matter what. And so we have to guard how we speak so that even our words are for life. Not just our thoughts, but our words and our actions. So being for life certainly includes, I hope you've seen, I'm not trying to, to shift away from 
advocating for the protection of life in the womb, I'm trying to see us expand it to love for women and men who are facing unplanned pregnancies, for those who have experienced abortion, and then even beyond the issue of abortion. Because being for life means caring for and speaking up for a broader range of marginalized people than just the unborn. People like immigrants, or the disabled, or prisoners, or orphans, or widows, the financially impoverished, you know, all of those are listed in the Scriptures. As people who are valuable to God and that we should love and care for. That we should have value for. Now, I understand these can't all be your cause. Right? I mean, I can't stand, in a sense, for all of these things in the sense of being, oh, I'm super active and all of it. And if anybody gets that, trust me, I do. I get letters probably every week and emails saying, Pastor, you've got to support this cause. Give money to that cause. Do this thing. (laughs) And lead your church to follow this, that, or the other. I, I know the pressure. And I'm not saying, oh, you have to adopt every one of these as your cause. What I'm saying is every one of these deserves respect, dignity, value, and love. And who knows? For some of you, maybe one of those will become your cause. Maybe God will move in your heart with compassion and passion to begin speaking up louder and louder for one of those. To be for life in a whole new way you've never thought of before. You know, when God moves and puts a passion on your heart, that's how new ministries start. That's how nonprofits get started. That's how movements start. So maybe being for life will mean for you in a very practical way to see where there are hurting, marginalized people and to begin to speak for them and act for them. And for all of us, it means we must have compassion in our hearts and guard our words to speak only in ways that will build up and esteem, even as we speak the truth. Even as, and especially when, we speak the truth. I want to end with Matthew 25. Right, That was our scripture reading. And here was a picture to me of what it means to be for life. This is the summary, I think, of what it's saying. If we're saying that God is for life and we're going to follow in his footsteps and be for life. And so, again, what is the story? What is the picture that Jesus paints here? It's judgment at the end of the world. And he, who is the only one who can judge truly and rightly, says, I'm separating out sheep and goats. And the sheep, he says, here's why you are with me. Here's why the kingdom of God is yours to inherit. Because... Whenever you saw me hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, imprisoned, you had compassion on me. And then what's the response? What? I don't remember seeing you hungry. Lord, when did we see you naked and needing clothes? When did we see you imprisoned and needing compassion? And his words, which are what it means to be for life, is as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, You did it to me. That's the picture of pro-life that I want to have for me. And that's the picture I want of our church. If we're going to say we are pro-life, let's be pro-life in the biggest sense possible. Father, thank you for having a heart of compassion on those of us who have failed you and fallen short in so many ways. But you have put in us your image. You have given to us the gift of life. You, the source of life, have poured it out in us, and we thank you for that. Give us eyes to see even the least of these, even our enemies, as of inestimable worth and value because they are made in your image. Help us to speak truth. Help us to be truth speakers, but help us to do it in a way that affirms this tremendous value for all people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you think about this week, if, if any of you get emails or any of that kind of stuff from Christian organizations and they talk about sanctity of life, I hope that you will have a passion for the unborn or the preborn children. But I hope also that passion will begin to maybe radiate even beyond. And let it be together. <laughs> let one feed the other, if you will so that we can be for life. Would you stand and let me leave you with a word of blessing? I want to speak the words of Romans 15 over you because it's hard not to feel a little hopeless when we look around. 
But we have a God who is the infinite God of hope. So we always have a source of hope. So God's word spoken over you is this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I might abound in hope. God bless you, and thank you for joining us online as well. If you're here, would you be seated, and I'll begin dismissing us in an orderly fashion. It's sunny. It's not super, super cold outside. If you want to hang out and talk to some of your friends for a little while, I encourage you to spend some time fellowshipping. And notice the uh, progress made on the building. I think we're going to be seeing it come together in the next couple of weeks and be able to celebrate that it's finished. So, God bless you all. Bessies, you're, you're leading the way. Thank you, and have a good Sunday. All right, so I think everyone here knows the routine, so instead of me spelling it out, just do it in an orderly fashion when the row in front of you is done. Then we go to the next 